So, so that's who I am. I'm Jim Sheedy. Uh, I'm an optometrist. Uh, been involved a lot more years than I want to suggest. And I'm out in uh, uh, Pacific University, out in Forest Grove, Oregon, which is about 25 miles west of Portland. And uh, I run what's called the Vision Performance Institute. And we've been doing some research in vision at 3D displays, and we're working pretty closely. In fact, our laboratory is a member of the 3D at Home Consortium. And uh, I've titled this the Visual System and Virtual 3D. Uh, the word virtual turns out to be a little controversial, but I want to use this presentation to emphasize the fact that the depth perception we're getting watching TV or movie is different than real 3D. It really is a virtual 3D. I mean, we know that, don't we? I mean, when you're watching a movie, you know it's on a flat screen, yet you perceive depth. It's different than the real world, a point that I definitely want to, uh, to make here. So, we've all seen these old silent movies, right? Uh, and, and remember how those old silent movies, first of all, they're pretty grainy. Uh, they're uh, 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 stuttered movement. You know, it's not, not good smooth movement. They're black and white. Uh, I really think it's an okay analogy to where we are with 3D displays today. There's a lot in 3D displays that we don't know yet, and it's going to improve. It's good today, but it, it can be improved. I think most anyone in the industry will tell you there's a lot we don't know about how we can get virtual 3D to look more like real 3D. Let's talk about depth perception. This is flat, right? But you see depth in here. We've, we've seen depth in photographs. We've seen depth in movies. We've seen depth in TV. It's because we've got monocular cues to depth. This depth that you see in here, I mean, and this is just sort of like a cartoon illustrating some of the same things you see in here, you see the depth because of perspective, because of object overlay. Uh, these are very powerful cues to depth. And the movie industry, the film industry, the content producers have been great at using monocular cues to create depth. Okay? So, and this is still going to be the strongest uh, uh, stimulus for us to see depth. So how does the current 3D work? How does the current virtual 3D work? The main cues to depth are still monocular. Those cues are still there as they always have been. Disparity stimulates stereopsis. I, I need to inform you a little bit more about what disparity is. And so disparity to stimulate stereopsis, and stereopsis signals only relative depth. So that's what we're getting from 3D displays is it's a sense of the eyes. And it's, it's a result of disparity or, in effect, the fact that the two images are not exactly the same. And our brain's got an amazing ability to, in effect, put together the disparities in the signal and give us a sensation of depth. And that's what the, uh, the, the, the 3D does for us. Let's talk about the eyes. The eyes are about, on the average, Chris, you say 63 millimeters apart. It's about two and a half inches is about how far apart the eyes are. Our eyes view the world from a different angle. Every time we look at something, our eyes are looking from the world at a different angle, and it kind of results in this type of a thing. You, 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 look at the, you, you line yourself up with those bowling pins, but the right eye is looking just to the right of it, the left eye is looking to the left of it, and we see those bowling pins from slightly different angles. So that if you are focused on the white one, well, the red one looks to the right of the red, or the, the red one looks to the right of the white one with your right eye, it looks to the left of it with your left eye, and that is the signal that your visual system is really good at putting together and causing you to sense that the red one is behind the white one. It's a sensation. It's a, it, it, it's a real great ability of our vision. And it turns out the visual system is really good at doing this, really precise. So that's what stereopsis is. It's a sensation. OK, the eyes, two and a half inches apart. Look at all these cameras, all these 3D cameras. And, and our next presenter is going to tell us a lot more about this stuff, I think. Uh, uh, the separation between the lenses is not always the same as the eyes. And something I've learned is the content providers. Content providers, those are the people who are making 3D content. You know, sometimes it's done in animation, sometimes it's done by, in, in, in a gaming environment, very often it's done in movies. And you want the two cameras to be separated just as the eyes are separated. But 
the amount of the separation can vary. Sometimes it's only half an inch. Sometimes they actually make it wider. And, and it depends a lot on the artistic creation that they, the, the, you know, what is the sensation that the artist wants to create in terms of the 3D effect. But what, so, so right away here, we can see that we're creating environments that are not exactly what the eyes would perceive in that particular environment. Uh, and this affects the amount of disparity. Uh, the amount of disparity is the difference in, in angle between two objects as seen with the right eye and, and the left eye, just as those bowling pins. Uh, you know, the, 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 the angle between two objects is different in the right eye than in the left eye, and that's what's interpreted as depth. And so the actual angles that are creating disparity in a movie can be different than the angles that your eyes would receive in that same environment. Um, there's a whole lot, it, it looks to me like stereopsis, we pretty much know it only stimulates relative depth. There's no absolute depth information in stereopsis, or is there? Uh, some things that I think we still need to know, but it's almost like uh, this technique of presenting virtual 3D is uh, cr creating, uh, it, it's, it's setting up a visual stimulation in the world that's different than what we experience in the real world. 3D is really, it is virtual. It's, it's, sending, it's, it's using the visual system in a unique way that is different than our real world. Okay? When we change our viewing distance, what happens? Two major functions inside the eye change. For example, when you look up close, there's a lens inside the eye that this muscle goes around it and it contracts and the, 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 the lens fattens up and allows you to see up close. When you look far away, well, that muscle relaxes, pulls that lens flatter, less, less power to it. So this is one thing, we call this accommodation. Changing the focus of the eyes. When you get to be my age, you've lost it. Uh, 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 but until you're about 40, you've got very good facile use of accommodation. You change your focus depending on the viewing distance. One other thing that changes regularly is the convergence. When you look up close, okay, your mama told you not to do this, right? When you look up close, your eyes converge. When I, when I look up this close, you can clearly see my eyes are converging. But even here, at normal reading distance, my eyes are converging more than if I look at distance. So convergence needs to change. Convergence and accommodation both change, and they change in a regular pattern. In the real world, when you look at that object, this object, and this object, the convergence changes and the accommodation changes. And there is a regular and fixed relationship to them. They change in the same amount in the real world. X units of accommodation are associated with X units of convergence. It, 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 it's a real and fixed relationship. What happens in the 3D world? In the 3D world, the disparity is created by showing a different image to the right and the left eyes. Okay? And, but the display is right here. So in the virtual 3D world, the eyes have got to do a new trick. It's a trick that they don't usually do in the real world. In the virtual world, you need to change your convergence angle to look at different objects, but they're all on a screen that's a fixed distance from your eyes. So you don't want to accommodate. So in this environment, you want to converge without accommodating. It's a new trick for the eyes. It turns out the eyes are amazingly adaptable for many people. Some people have more problems with a new trick. And that's why we have some people getting problems with 3D. Uh, here's, here's one study we did at the VPI. Uh, I want to acknowledge Intel, who's helped to sponsor a lot of these studies. Thank you, Phil. I'll introduce you shortly. Uh, what we did is we had a group of subjects view the same display in effect the same content by the same content provider and we had them view it in 2D and in 3D and we simultaneously measured the vergence position of the eyes and the accommodative state of the eyes. And these are the standard deviations of vergence and accommodation and this is 3D and these are different 
epochs, I think they're each 20 minute epochs of watching a 100 minute movie. And we can see for each 20 minute epoch, there was more change in virgin's response during 3D viewing than 2D viewing. The eyes do react differently when viewing 3D than viewing 2D. And we can also look at the accommodative response. And again, we see the accommodative response of the visual system is changing more during 3D viewing than 2D viewing. Now, we also conducted a home theater study uh, to compare symptoms between 2D and 3D viewing. Uh, 205 adults uh, randomly assigned to 2D or 3D viewing. Uh, we, we use questionnaires to, uh, to, to determine what types of symptoms they're having. And this shows the change in symptoms for each subject before and after viewing the movie. Okay? And if, if the symptoms increase after viewing the movie, they're in this direction. If they decreased, they're in this direction. And you can see 2D versus 3D. And the 3D are the blue bars. And you can see that quite clearly, we are getting more symptoms in the group that, that watch 3D compared to 2D. So yes, we, there, are, there are more symptoms being caused. Uh, what we need to do is we need to figure out why? What, 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 was, what was the characteristic of those people who had, the, had more symptoms than others? Uh, that, 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 that's, that's the next phase of the research that we need to get involved with. So conclusion so far, virtual 3D requires unique vision skills. 3D currently works well but can be improved. You know, it's, uh, we, we've still got a, a flickering low resolution black and white image there. You know, we, we still have way, uh, a, a way to go to improve it. Uh, there's more eye and disorientation symptoms caused by 3D viewing. Uh, I haven't emphasized the disorientation symptoms, but people are getting vertigo problems, uh, dizziness, nauseousness. Uh, we need to figure out why. Uh, is there a visual reason? There can be visual reasons for that. There can be uh, vestibular reasons for that. It could be that we're just creating a more realistic and immersive experience for people. And yeah, it's, maybe people are, some people like this. I mean, lots of people <laughs> like taking carnival rides and being spun around a lot, you know? So uh, we are creating a more immersive experience here. Uh, we have, we've got a research plan moving forward, trying to figure out who's having problems with 3D displays. We want to measure, develop a metric of the quality of the 3D experience. You know, uh, what is the quality of the immersive experience? That's, that's really what the industry is, is after providing. Do subjects disconnect accommodation of virgence? I, I showed you that subjects do engage in more virgence and accommodation changes when watching 3D compared to 2D. Well, those two functions do have a neurological connection between them. And we, I think we need to better understand, are they, in effect, working in synchrony? Or are they kind of disconnected? That, that, that can have some uh, implications for who's having problems and uh, what we may be able to do about them. Uh, we're going to develop a clinical testing instrument and testing paradigm for 3D viewing. Since 3D viewing does involve special tricks of the visual system, what can we do to uh, uh, test individual eyes to determine if that person, that person sitting in the exam chair, is at risk for the types of symptoms that are being experienced. Uh, we need to study the relationship between measures of human vertigo sensitivity and developments. So, so we need to understand this vertigo response. Uh, and as Dr. Duane has just so clearly illustrated, you know, we believe that 3D viewing is a good screener for underlying vision problems. Well, I, th I, th I think we'd like to learn more about that and, and, and how effective is it as a screener compared to other screening techniques. It does work, yes. So we, uh, we are setting up a special 3D vision clinic. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll take responsibility for, I think it was in 1984, <laughs> setting up what we called then the VDTI clinic. I was at UC Berkeley at that time. And we studied only patients who were having problems working at computers at that time. And it, as part of that, it, it caused us to examine their work environment. It also caused us to critically examine the aspects of the visual system that were causing the problems people were getting at the computer displays. And we're going to do the same thing here with this 
uh, uh, 3D vision clinic. We're going to do some special testing. We're going to start gathering some data about what it is uh, we can do to solve individual patient problems. What is it that's causing people problems? And we're going to coordinate it with our research lab. Uh, uh, the, the measurements, the special measurements that we're going to make in the, in the research clinic, or excuse me, in, in the patient care clinic, we're also going to be having that same equipment uh, uh, and, and testing methodologies in the research lab so that we can, you know, pair what we're doing in research with what's happening in the clinic and, and, and they can both inform one another. Um, and then I also just would like to put in a plug for the research conference we're going to be hold, holding June 1 through 3 uh, out in Forest Grove. Uh, I'd like to say Forest Grove always looks like that, but uh, it doesn't this week. Uh, but hopefully the first week in June it will. So uh, with that, I'll end my presentation. <laughs>